Hi everyone, uh, my name is David Rao. I'm the music teacher who blogs at makemomentsmatter.org. Uh, you can also find me on Facebook, obviously, uh, Pinterest, Twitter, Instagram, and a bunch of other places. You can also find my podcast, which is Make Moments Matter, a music education podcast. Um, but today I'm uh, doing this live video to talk with you just a little bit about ORF instrument centers and also non-pitched instrument centers. Um, because I've been talking a lot um, both here and on the blog about centers and um, actually I just had um, I just posted a blog post last night about center logistics because that's one of the things that really stresses me out when thinking about centers is how many kids in a group how often do you rotate where do you do uh, centers how many kids are in a center who gets to choose what kids are in a center and all of those like logistic things, the how, the what, the why, that's what stresses me out. So that's why I did a blog post and I just posted that, you can find it on makemomentsmatter.org um, about center logistics. But I wanted to talk to you today specifically about, um, about centers that involve the ORF instruments, the pitch percussion, and also non-pitch percussion. Um, I did a workshop this spring um, with the Mid-Michigan ORF um, Shulbrook Association about all about centers, not just this stuff, um, but a lot of other things. That's That was four hours long, and no way am I gonna get to that in this one video. So I'm just gonna talk to you just about this one specific kind of center. But like I said, there are blog posts online that you can see about some of those other things too. Um, or you can eat, you know, ask a question here or whatever, I'd be happy to answer it. But I wanted to talk to you specifically about instrument centers. I've talked already in videos about recorder centers and playing uh, things like that, but I've never talked about this kind. I think that this kind of center stresses a lot of people out. Uh, they're like, wait, you want students to work independently with my precious ORF instruments? No way. And then I'm like, you know, and then it's like, well, what about non-pitch percussion? No, that Wero has been in the closet for 40 years. It is fragile. It's like, uh, yes, but it, it also is an instrument. It's meant to be played. Um, and so, I'm gonna encourage you through this video with some ideas about how you can get students to do centers without destroying things, um, and also why it's important and some of the things you can do to make it a little bit easier. So, um, instrument centers. I, I always try and do any center I'm gonna do, I do it as a whole group activity. So I, it's the same for instrument centers. So for example, if students, you know, if we've done a reading activity or a rhythm activity and they have instruments in their hand, um, I might pull out some of the instrument cards, um, and I have a whole set of instrument task cards. I might pull out those cards and do it in a large group. Um, so for instance, if I said, uh, if we were doing like castanets, this is a great example. Um, I might pull out my document camera and show them all this task card, which I know is backwards because I'm using my phone, sorry, and the, the FaceTime camera does everything backwards. So here's what it looks like. But it says, try playing these rhythms with the castanets. So if I put it on my document camera, they would see it all the right direction and the whole class could see it. And if we all had enough castanets, that's one of the instruments that I have enough for a whole class because a couple years ago, someone decided that I should have 40 castanets. So I have 40 castanets. Um, but I would show them the rhythm and I'd say, okay, great, let's read the rhythm first. ta di ta ta di ta 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 di ta and for those of you TT people out there, T T ta, T T ta, ta ta, T T ta. So we'd read it first, we'd say the rhythm, and then we'd play it. We'd click it. Dun 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 dun. And at that point, I'd probably say, you know what? Is there another way you could hold the castanet? Ta T T ta, T T ta, or whatever. And we'd try it a couple different ways. We'd explore. The next task card is really good for um, exploration. The the next castanet task card, and it says. What can you do when you play with two? Can you play with the instruments while you look like a lobster? You know. <laughs> uh, can you hold one high and one low? Can you make them look like they're talking to one another? What else can you do? Those are prompts that I would use, like I said, with the whole class. And that's just to show them, I would put this on the document camera, I would show them, I'd read through it, and then I'd let them explore for just a minute. And the reason I would do it that way is so that they can see the card, they see that you read through first, go all the way through first, and then do it. And that they're allowed to do it. That's what the task card is there to do. I would start with this other one that's a little bit more structured with the rhythm first, just so that they can see the process of read it, try it, do it. 
and then I would give them this one's a little bit more unstructured. If I had the time and options, I would pull out another one, maybe with a smaller group, um, or you know, maybe every other person or whatever if we had you know tambourines. Where's the best way to play that, or where's the best, where, what's the best way to play the tambourine? Shake it, tap it, use a mallet, tremble, squirm, explore and find out. Maybe I would have, you know, small groups of like four or five different groups of six or seven kids, and I would give, um, the way I made these task cards is I have like two tambourine, two hero, two maraca, two woodblock, and so maybe one day as a whole group, I would show them on the document camera, we'd do the castanets together, and then I'd break them into their small groups, and they could try these things in different small groups. It's still sort of a whole group activity, but the idea is that then we could eventually transition to where they're doing it on their own. And if we've done this process, if we've gone through this process together as a whole class, once everyone doing castanets, and then small groups where they're doing it on their own, with other individual instruments that we haven't tried all together, but they've seen the castanet process. Then they're getting it in, in smaller groups and eventually we can break it down even smaller. So when they're doing centers with only like two or three kids, they're able to do this independently with cards that they've not seen before. So that sort of gently pushes them into the process. If we can do the castanet thing all together, or maybe you don't have castanets, maybe you have maracas, or maybe you don't have a class set of anything, well, then you could take something like this rain stick one where it says, how many seconds does it take for the sound of the rain stick to stop? That's something you could put on the document camera and you could have one kid come up and hold the rain stick because I certainly hope you don't have like 35 rain sticks. But you could have one kid come up and hold it and the class could count together how long does it take. They could experience it together even if you don't have one for every kid. It would be a whole group thing still even if they're not doing it all together. Another um, one is this one, um, and it says, use different mallets and sticks to strike the cowbell. What do you like best? And this has a couple different colors and things and mallets. So you could have a kid come up and hold the cowbell and you could have them try it with different mallets. It would feel like a whole group activity since everyone is watching and is invested in the activity. Maybe you could give one mallet to each different kid and you have different kids come up and play it. And then it's a whole group thing, but really it's easy then to transfer the skill to small groups. So if I were doing this in centers um, and I wanted to transfer the task cards to centers, I have, I think, 20 non-pitch percussion task cards. So let's say you're like, well, I have cowbells, thanks David, but I don't have a kibasa. Okay, well, take those out. Um, and I have a go-go bells, great, I can do that. I don't have wee rows I trust the kids with. Okay, well then take those out. Don't do those ones. Do the ones that you're comfortable with. Put those in centers. And um, in my most recent blog post, I talk about uh, the center logistics and what kinds of centers, things like that. And I would say if you're doing non-pitch percussion instruments in centers, don't have all of your centers be non-pitch percussion. Maybe if you have eight different centers going around the room, and I would say point them towards the wall, sort of deadens the sound a little bit. If you have eight going around the room, maybe four of them are non-pitch percussion. Maybe three of them are non-pitch percussion. And then that cuts down in the overall sound. So if you have like one center of kids with a rain stick, and then the next center could be rhythm reading, and the next center could be notes on the staff reading, like a, a matching game or something like that. The next one could be another non-pitch percussion, and that could be tambourines, so that could be wood blocks, or whatever you wanna do. I try and be sort of wise about it so that I'm not putting really loud instruments in all those centers, because if you had every center was a non-pitch percussion and they were all loud instruments, you would hate yourself and me for suggesting that. <laughs> so, um, like I said, there are 20 different task cards. I think that there are 10 instruments and two task cards for each one. So if you have all of these instruments, great. Well then you, I would say, do cent, you could do centers four times and switch out the instruments every time. So one time you're using egg shakers, the next time egg shakers, castanets, handbell, or uh, cowbells and maracas. Okay, next time you do centers, do tambourine, rain stick, you know, a go go bells and kabasa or whatever, and that gives you some variety. It also lets you extend the life of this resource um, so that you, you get more out of it. Um, 
and, and that helps you just a little bit with the resource. Hillary asks, how long do you keep the kids in a center before switching? I talk about that in the blog post. <laughs> but I'll, I'll tell you sort of briefly, it, there is not a right answer. It depends. It depends on the kind of content they're handling. It depends on if they've tried it before. It depends on the age of the student. So it's hard for me to give a blanket. Three minutes, you know, but it, it really does depend. So if in your other centers you are having them focus on like rhythm reading or composition or something that is more difficult, you need to give them a little bit more time. If I'm basing it on these, uh, it also depends. Am I putting just the egg shaker things in one center? Well, if they go through these, it depends on how well they read, you know, so what grade level are you putting it with? But I would say if you're giving them just the egg shaker cards in just one center, then maybe three minutes, maybe four. It depends on how, you know, adventurous your kids are. You could also, to extend the life of this, in each center you could put just the egg shaker cards and then you could put five or six rhythm cards. So if you finish with this, play the rhythm on your instrument. Rearrange, play the instrument again. Rearrange, play the instrument again. So, sorry Hillary, there's not an easy answer, but it, it, it all is all dependent upon the content and it dependent upon the level of your kids and the age and how much, how well they're, they, they do with this and that sort of thing, sorry. Um, the next, the other question from, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your name, uh, Ros Rosen, hi from Ireland, just wondering, do you do teacher training workshops? Yes, in the United States, I've done workshops around the country, never like, come to Atlanta and take David's training, but like I, I've done like ORF workshops and things like that. Um, okay, not done. So non-pitch percussion, like I said, I have a, a bunch of these cards and I think there are 20 non-pitched. If you're gonna do this with instruments, I would say, again, be choosy about what you do. If you're using maracas, am I gonna put out this like vintage, obviously it was a souvenir from somebody who went to like somewhere in Mexico and bought it, it's really nice, no. Am I gonna put out this wooden one that's decorative? It's a little bit more uh, durable, but in the hands of uh, some of my kids in a center on its own, may not last? No, I'm not gonna put that out. I'm gonna use the plastic one. <laughs> if I'm gonna put it out, or even, you could even, you know those, uh, they're little maracas that look like, like egg shakers. I don't currently have any at this school, but I know they exist. They're like egg shakers with a stick on them. Put that out, those are like indestructible. And those are easy for kids to use and they don't take up much space. So something like that would be great. So just be choosy with your instruments. Um, you might also, if you're gonna put in an instrument that they don't know as well, you might just do quick before you start centers. You might say, you guys are so good at these instruments. Just one quick reminder, cause I know it's been a while. The Wii row, remember you don't hold it here. You know, it's got these two holes and those are for your fingers. Sort of like a bowling ball. That's where you put your fingers and then it's a scraper. Remember, it's not a tapper, it's not a shaker, it's a scraper, but you guys are so smart, I know you remember that. Doing something like that cuts down a lot of the issues that you might come up with. So, I, I, I am careful about which instruments I put out, one, and then two, I do, for a couple of those weird instruments or things that you might be worried they're gonna break it or they're gonna do something, just give them a quick reminder or a quick uh, once over of like, Remember this awesome instrument that's brand new and that is expensive, that we don't wanna break? You know, here's how you play it, here's how you hold it, this is why, you know, this is where you put your fingers or whatever. Because you're so smart, you're good musicians, so you wanna do it the right way. That's my quick reminder for them. Okay, let's move to pitch percussion so I can show you those task cards and how I use it. Um, I'm gonna have to move just a second across the room over here. Um, so when I come to the pitch percussion instruments, again, this is something I would start out with a whole group. So for instance, um, if we were at the Orphan Instruments and we were playing or doing something as a warm up, I might pull out this and put it on the document camera or I could project it up on the, if you get this resource, you get it as a PDF so you could get it and zoom in or whatever. Um, it says play this pattern on any of the bars using C, D, E, G, or A. So, quick reminder, that's C pentatonic. So if you are already set in C pentatonic, then your F bar comes off, and your B comes off, and your other F comes off. Um, and it says, play this rhythm 
Use both of your mallets to play on the bars. Okay, so you can maybe see there is ta dee ta ta dee ta, or for some of you, ti ti ta ti ti ta, or for some of the rest of you, do day do do day do, or whatever you say, unimportant. But C D E G or A, and if I were doing it with a whole group, I might say, you know what? This time, let's try it on just G or A, since they're right next to each other. Let's just try it. Ta di ta ta di ta. And I would probably give the students an example. I'd say, this is how I'm going to do it. That sounded so cool. I used both my mallets and I used two bars. What if I did it like this? Different. Still cool. What if I did this? Ah, cool. What if I did this? That's still following the rules, G and A, and I'm doing the right rhythm. Now, would this work? Then the kids would be like, no, why? Well, because you used a B, and that's one they said you can't do. Okay. And then if I said, oh, sorry, the, oh, okay, sorry. I thought <laughs> my Facebook had just shut up. Um, then I might say, what about this? say no. Why not? Well, because that's not one of the rhythms that it said you could do. It said you could do C, D, E, G, or A, and the rhythm has to be ta, di, ta, ta, di, ta. Okay, well then maybe I should try it on C, D, and E. Oh, cool. Let me try it on another one. Oh, cool. Let me try another. And by this time they're like, we get it, Mr. Rowe. You get variation, follow the rules, let us do it. And so I, I do that in a large group and I give them my example. Really what that is, that's a critical thinking strategy. That's, a, that's basically a think aloud. I'm showing them my thought process. Oh, I could use these. Oh, I could use these. Hmm, but can I do this rhythm? I, I'm processing through it with them. And that's just a strategy that's just good teaching. It's not necessarily task cards or centers or anything else, but I'm just going through it with them to give them sort of the idea. Okay, so I do that as a whole group and I let them try it. And then um, I would try another one. Find the smallest bar you have and play this pattern four times. That's what it looks like. Ta di ta di ta ta. Okay, find the smallest bar. That's this one. Ta di ta di ta ta. That's more specific. They don't get a choice in that. They have to use the smallest bar. They have to play that rhythm, but it requires them to think about it. Really what these centers are doing, they're, they're exploration, yes, but they're also critical thinking. You're requiring the student to follow a set of guidelines and ideas to, to get to an end product. Okay, let's see what I'm trying. This one says, use both mallets to play on the bar D, alternate one hand, then the other. Looks like that. And it says R, L, R, L. Okay. Well, so whether, they, whether or not they're doing right and left, you know, who knows. But um, ideally, so far, all of this has been C pentatonic, which is great. They might do it a couple times. You could do that as a large group. You could do that just as a warm up. You could pull a random card, no matter what it is you're doing at the bars, and you could try it. If you have to rotate, you don't have enough instruments for all the kids to play all the time, you have to rotate, pull a new card, or do the same card or whatever if the last one was really successful. But like I said, I start with this as a large group activity. I don't make it intensive or a lot of time two minutes before you do something at the instruments or the end of class. Before you're gonna put away, you're like, oh man, well we're done with the game and activity that I was gonna do, but we're at the instruments already. Boom, pull out a card, do that, try it out, and the kids really like that. Okay, so if you're giving these ki kids these cards and you wanna do more of a small group thing, even though it's the, large, the, the whole class, you could put it up on the document camera, you could project the PDF, or whatever, um, and then if you wanted, you could then break kids down into different groupings. You could say, okay, all the altos form a little group, and if you have wheeled instruments, I don't. If you have instruments on wheels, great, or on carts, great. They can go, you know, all the altos can go together, all the sopranos can go together. You could do woods and metals in groups, and you could give them two or three cards, and you say, try one, um, in about two minutes, I'm gonna I'm gonna ding the bell, and then you have to you have to pass the card. You know that keeps them on the same instrument. They're trying different things, or you could say when the bell rings, you switch instruments. Oh, cool. That's really not a, a centers thing so much. If they're just 
moving around or whatever. It's, I mean, sort of, but it's just a way to rotate kids through the instruments and try different things with these task cards. As they're exploring and doing this, I would be walking around, I'd be checking, and some people I know have said things like, yeah, but like, how do you know they're treating the instruments right? Well, I'm rotating around the room, you know, and I'm checking in with them, I'm listening, and hopefully by this point, you know, we've talked about what what is a nice way to play the instruments? How do you play them respectfully? What does that look like? How does mallet hold work? You know, how, how, what's that all look like? And this is just an exploration based on all of that previous learning. I also put kids in groups of, well, if we're talking about the activity we're doing that I just mentioned, you know, five or six. If we're if we move on to the centers portion, two or three, and even then, kids can work together. You have learning partners, so one can say you're not playing that very well, you know, you're playing too hard, or I can't really hear that, or whatever, and that helps sort of guard the instrument a little bit, and guard the group. Um, sorry, I keep moving, but it's not comfortable to like this. Apparently I'm too old. Um, okay, so the task cards themselves, there are a lot of different kinds. Um, there's, you know, mallet technique things, really, that's what's hidden in there. Um, there's this one, which is sort of improvisation. It says, play the pattern below using the given notes while you're still set in C pentatonic, great. This one's a little bit more tricky for them because it's uh, C, D, E, and low, la, and low, so. Okay, well then they have to move up here. That's sort of cool. But it means you can set your instrument in C pentatonic and then leave it for all of this. Um, but then they are improvising because they get the choice of the different notes with the easy rhythm. They can try it a bunch of different ways. I always say, if you've done it once, try it a different way. Um, meaning don't change the rhythm, but try different bars, see what you like. Um, this one is another mallet technique. It says, see if you can make the best bounce on the bar. Not too hard and not too light. Bounce until the bar rings. Okay, well for this one, that's really fun. Because wooden, wooden bars, there's always the, the kid who does that. So this is challenging them to listen to their own playing and to think past the fear of, am I getting it right? This is just bounce the mallet. And when do we have time to do that? You know, like just listen to the sound. So if you put that in a center, that gives a kid a chance to actually listen to what they're doing. It's really fun if you put them on the metallophones uh, because then they can really hear it ring. Um, and then there's some other exploration things. There's playing the patterns. There's um, really what these task cards are for the pitch percussion is improvisation on different notes, um, using the given rhythms, um, there's a lot of mallet technique. There are a lot of things hidden in there of like getting them to switch hands or do bump, 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 you know, do different hand, different things, um, and to take what they already know and put it into practice. So that's really what those pitch percussion cards are about. Again, there are 20 of them. So you could, uh, you know, spread them out. You could have all of them with one instrument. You could have, you know, just the blue ones with one instrument, just the green ones with one instrument. You could do whatever you want. And again, if I were doing this in centers, I would have one center with maybe a couple woods or one center with the basses and then a reading center or a music listening center or something else. And I'd spread them around the room if possible um, and then sort of mix things up. And like I said, I probably wouldn't put all the cards with one thing because if you put 20 cards with one instrument, they'd be like, good, done, good, done, good, done, good, done, good, done. And they'd be, it'd be a race to get all the cards when really I want them to really take the time with the card to really experience it and go through it. So I would give probably just a few in each spot, let them try it, let them do it. And then we'd rotate after a few minutes. Again, depending upon all those other factors, we'd rotate when it's appropriate. Um, a couple thoughts about saving your instrument. So again, you could have that conversation at the beginning, like you guys are so good at playing these instruments, but just remember, here's how you hold them, blah, blah, blah. Remember, we are not trying to break the bars. That is not our goal. Our goal is to make the very best sound. You know, so if, if I come around or if you're a learning partner, you know, I come up to you and they say, I don't know if, you know, Jose's making the best sound, or I don't know if, you know, Brittany is hitting as soft as she needs to or whatever, well then I'm gonna come check. You know, and so to, to give them a little bit of a reminder of that. The other thing I would say is with these instruments, you may also want to think about your mallets. So I have these really sad uh, mallets that are doing this. Um, I swear these instruments have, 
are very old. I swear, when I got here, they've never been used. They, you know how you can just like tell if a kid has touched something? <laughs> I'm pretty sure they never have. And yet in this first year, this is what's happening. I don't know. So uh, if you have malice that you're worried about, don't leave those in centers. Um, maybe pull out some other mallets that you're not, you know, so worried, like rubber mallets if you have them. The only trick about that is that rubber mallets are going to be louder, so uh, you could always pull those really soft, like rainbow sort of mallets that come with uh, sound shapes or come with lollipop drums, um, or you could pull out something that is maybe old but is very is soft that no matter how hard they hit is not going to make a terrible, terrible sound. Or you know, if there are other things you have that you know are very soft, you could trust them more with that. Um, but, I mean, like I said, there's, there's always the trade-off of durability of mallets versus how loud is it gonna make your instrument. I would never in a bajillion years in centers put wooden mallets, I mean, wooden-headed mallets on a xylophone. The harder the mallet is, the louder it's gonna sound, and I don't wanna, I don't want my ears to bleed when this is all happening, so, <laughs> so I'd put softer things in there. Um, but yeah, like I said, it, if, you, if you're if rotating around the room, if you hear an emergency, you know, like, bam, <laughs> like go over and check in, it's your goal to rotate. But the less kids you have playing centers, so if you have eight centers and three or four of them are playing centers, you have less freak out moments because the other kids are just, you know, reading rhythms or matching card games or whatever. In the last video I did, I showed um, a couple different um, task card things with, with other uh, activities like rhythm reading or whatever that you can go back with that video and see some other types of activity but if you have eight centers and only four of them are playing well then you can easily sort of shuffle around and check in with all the groups I don't know if that if that gets everything that I want to talk about there's a lot to talk about with centers which is why I filled a whole four-hour um, or local ORF chapter workshop with it um, but there are, these are, there's a lot of tips to sort of get you going with how you could maybe use this resource or how you could adapt something like this. If you have questions, leave them in the comments and I will come back tonight or come back tomorrow or whenever you leave your comment, I'll come back and try and answer it. Um, these cards are new to me. I just, uh, like I said, I made them for the, the ORF workshop I went and did in Michigan, but they're in my Teachers Pay Teachers store. If you're interested, I will post a link. Um, and you can also just go through and preview and be like, hmm, I don't know if I want this or not, but you can see that in there. Um, but like I said, try it out like, and start with a whole group, then move to small groups or then move to centers when the kids are ready or when you emotionally are ready to let go of your instruments a little bit and trust your students. Um, I can't say that this is perfect, but I can say that when I've done this, I have seen so much exploration and so many laughs and so much fun and the kids, then the next time we use the instruments for like a, an arrangement or something, they are like a thousand times more confident, they're more excited and, and it's worth it to me. So like I said, uh, if you have any questions, leave them in there. Check out my blog, makemomentsmatter.org. I just did two blog posts, one about uh, five different types of learning center you can use in elementary music rotations and another one just last night about um, the logistics of rotations and centers and all of those things. Check that out. But if you have questions about this process or anything else, leave me a comment here or shoot me uh, a message on Facebook or my emails, makemomentsmatter at gmail.com. Um, I'd love to try and answer that for you. But thanks so much for watching. I hope this has been fun and helpful. Um, and I'll see you next time. Good night. <laughs>